Marcus. Marcus, what have you done? Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the video that you guys have been waiting for. Our budget-friendly gaming PC build 2023. Throughout this video, we're going to show you just how easy it is to put yourself together your very own gaming PC. And of course, we're going to show you those all-important gameplay benchmark numbers so you can see exactly how well this thing performs. All that's left to say is an absolute massive thank you to Gigabyte for actually sponsoring this. Let's get our build on. I'm going to keep this bit simple because I've done this take loads and loads of times now and it keeps getting too complicated, but the secret to a good budget-friendly gaming PC is to always prioritize the graphics card as much as possible. So the more you spend on this, as a general rule, the better your gameplay will be, the faster the frame rate, the more settings you can turn up, and the higher resolution you can run it at. The 7600 costs around about 250 to 280 pounds, depending on the version that you go for, and this does give you very good bang for the buck. But in order to stop this from being held back and what we call being bottlenecked, you will need a decent CPU. And by going for the AM5 platform from AMD and grabbing a Ryzen 7600 and grabbing a Ryzen 7600 CPU, these two are almost like the perfect pairing. This is not going to be the best CPU in the world for like doing loads of productivity, but for gaming, this thing is a steal. But as I say, regardless of whether you're going for a $500 gaming PC or a $5,000, choose these things first, and then it allows you to look at the rest of your components and get a good idea on how much it is you can and should actually spend on the other components. And once you fully understand this concept, everything else does get a lot easier. Take the motherboard, for instance, that we're using. This is a fantastic board. It is the B650 Aorus Elite AX from Gigabyte. And this is not the cheapest motherboard you can buy, but it still has all of the features, really, that you need. It's really well built, and you don't have to necessarily worry about upgrading it in the future. If you do want to get like a new CPU in a few years time, you could put a Ryzen 9 in this without any issues. You've got loads of USB. You've even got Wi-Fi as well, which as we know is very important to over 50% of gamers that watch this channel. Fun fact for you. It also supports three M.2 SSDs with this top slot actually supporting Gen 5. If you do want to see a full speed test, by the way, with Gen 4 versus 3, 5 SATA hard drive, you can find that video in the top right corner of your screen. Installing our six core AMD Ryzen CPU should be pretty straightforward. I think you can get these for around about £220 at the time of filming. Be careful not to over touch or anything, but in particular, once you open up this slot here with this lever to get this installed, all of these pins here are kind of death. Do not touch them or you could permanently damage or break your motherboard entirely. So please don't do that. Just drop it down without any force and then lower the lever back into place and this should just pop off for later on. I didn't make the joke that time. You will, of course, also need to grab yourself a set of memory. Here we have 16 gigabytes of DDR5, not DDR4, won't work on this motherboard. Well, why are you going for 16 gig? Surely 32 is worth the extra money? The answer is that it depends. I mean, if you're going for a more high-end system, then I think you will start to use it in the latest games when you have all of the settings turned up. But as this is not gonna be like a 4K Ultra system anyway, I don't think there's gonna be too many games that will actually take full advantage of more than 16 gigabytes of memory. And this is an easy way to grab yourself a nice fast kit and save yourself some money in the process. And besides, you can always just buy an identical kit and upgrade it to 32 gig at a later date if you find that you do need it. Another area that we can also save ourselves a little bit of money is with our storage. So we'll grab our Crucial P3 Plus. We remove this little SSD heatsink. Do make sure that you do actually take off the protective film on that so you get decent coverage. Pop this little slot open, insert our SSD, fit that into place, and then of course replace the heatsink. And then last thing before we actually get this inside of our new case is to actually install our cooler. And a lot of people will say, what are you doing here, Centric? I don't like the look of that box. This is the AMD stock Wraith Stealth cooler. To be honest with you guys, when you get this for free inside the box with your CPU, you'd be a a silly billy. You'd be a fool not to use it if you are trying to save money. You can just upgrade it next month with your next paycheck to something more substantial. And it does also have the bonus of being so easy to install. From my point of view, this is fantastic. I love stock coolers. You just need to remove the default AM5 mounting hardware. Grab your cooler, making sure that it does have some thermal paste that is actually pre-applied. But you see how easy that is to install. You literally just screw it down in a diagonal pattern and then Bob's your uncle, Geeker what's your arm, and you're away. One more thing to do before we forget though is just to plug this CPU fan into this little gray header at the top. And then for bonus points, just tidy up this cable by tucking it into the cooler itself. 
But let's now take this opportunity to press on to the most personal bit of any personal PC, the case of Enclosure. And this is a new one from Cooler Master. It literally rocked up at the studio today. This is the Q300L V2. And I've now realized that this is a micro ATX chassis and we're using a full size ATX board. Marcus. Marcus, what have you done? Oh. Fortunately for me, they did actually supply two cases. So little numpty PC centric here can actually press on with the video as if nothing has happened. One absolute numpty. This is something that is completely new. This is also from Cooler Master. Cube 500, keyword being flat pack. So it will save you some money. This costs around about 70 pounds at the time of filming because you have to assemble it yourself. So this is a way of getting more premium case without paying for the privilege. I mean, I hope this is gonna be easy to assemble. Oh, I'll tell you what though, that is solid. <laughs> that is a lot better than the cube we had a second ago, I'll tell you what. And they do say on the website it's fun. Well, this is definitely gonna be a bit of a mystery, isn't it? I can't actually work out what this case is gonna look like, but I know that step one is to grab our motherboard and place it on the motherboard tray. I mean, this bit is nice and easy, isn't it? You just line up the screw holes, grab the screws, get this fitted into place. Rather unusually, it says that the power supply is next, so let's go with that. This is one from EVGA. I know the exact version of this is gonna vary by territory, so we'll leave links to this and everything down in the description below if you wanna check current pricing or learn a little bit more. And yes, this is not a modular power supply because we are trying to save money. If you spend about an extra 20 pounds or so, then you can get one that has separate cables that you plug in and then you don't need to use all of them. Grab this, we slide it on, screw this into place, and then fan facing outwards, this hooks in like that, look. So does that mean you're gonna have all of these cables here visible? Hmm. Next up is the rear panel. This is gonna be simple. Lines up nice and neatly, actually. It's just four screws around the back. I know I might eat my words in a second, but I've got to say, I'm actually really enjoying this so far because it is something so different. This is like, unlike any build that I've done before, really. The next piece of the puzzle is going to be the graphics card. We're following the instructions to the letter here. And this is the one from Gigabyte. It is the 7600 Gaming OC. It's going to perfectly match our motherboard. It does use an 8-pin for power, so none of that new NVIDIA stuff. You do also have this little pass-through design for cooling. Obviously, it is a triple fan card, and I'll be amazed if if this makes any real audible noise, even when it's properly stressed out. That is the benefit of going for a lower power consumption card. But do be aware that while you're gonna have fantastic performance of this, it is kind of at the limit for VRAM. In the latest titles, if you wanna play 1440p max settings, then some of them will actually need a little bit more VRAM or you have to turn some settings down. So if you're worried about this, then obviously you can step up to a 7700 XT or something like the RTX 4070, but those are a fair bit more money really. So especially if you're playing multiplayer or you don't mind turning the textures down a little bit, this is gonna be a fantastic value card, especially at 1080p. But let us proceed to actually get this installed and they've already taken those slot covers out for us, which is nice. Line this up with our PCIe slot, give it a good push till you get that audible click, fit this down with the screws. I suppose while we're here, we can actually start plugging in our power supply cables so they're not just dangling there. We'll grab our very large ATX for our motherboard and plug this in here. We'll do the same with the graphics card with this little eight pin on the card itself. I'll feed our CPU connection around the back of this board and then connect it at the top. It's just this little eight pin. Then I'll grab the cable for this fan and plug this at the top next to the one we used for our CPU. The next bit was actually pretty unclear because it said install the front panel, but it wasn't obvious what the front panel was and that's because you've got to remove this bit of metal from it. You see, you see. Then it looks like the picture, and you can just lay this at the front of your chassis. A little bit more tricky now that they're actually cables, but still think pretty straightforward. And then once again, just screw it into place. Then we have what is starting to resemble a chassis. Do need to put the feet on the bottom, but we're certainly getting there. This is now what it's starting to look like around the back, by the way. As I say, pretty normal chassis, not the largest in the world. You can see why I suspected this might also be micro ATX, but no, if you do want a full size rig that is smaller, then I can see the appeal here. Let's turn this back over though and plug in all of our front panel connections. So we have our USB 3 down here at the bottom. USB C look is by the RAM. Our front panel is helpfully one big block just here. And then our HD audio is this one over here. Once again, just line that up, look. Pop it back and screw down. 
Now this next bit goes out to everyone that has a thing for feet. You see what I did there? They just clip in. Nice and easily. And then we have our kind of finished case, but not finished build, I guess. Do you see what I mean about how it is a very small chassis? Yeah, it can still take a lot of hardware. I'm liking this, and obviously there are so many different variations and things that you can do. If you want to have radiators and things, then I think you could lower this down, have them at the top, or you can have one on the side with a bracket. If you want to go for a vertical GPU mount, you can have this down here as well. I think we just need to stuff all of the cables around the back. And then let's see if there's somewhere that they can actually go. Not really, because usually you'd be able to put them in hard drive cages and things, but they're not actually here. You're gonna have to tie these down yourself, or I guess just kind of clamp them in place with the side panel. Yeah, the cable management in this case is actually atrocious. Really love what you've done, Cooler Master, but with the next iteration or next case that you do go down the flat pack route, and I'm a big fan of that, please make sure you have some, well, better cable management or at least some. The irony, of course, being if we'd gone for a modular power supply, we wouldn't really have this problem. Can we just hide it? Will that work? Yes, problem solved. We can put our front and top panels back on, add our tempered glass, and there we are. Built in a smaller time than it would take to do a normal PC if we were using a radiator. Maybe, I could be making that up. All in all, not bad. I would love to see how much money it actually saves by having it flat packed. I mean, does it really make that much difference or is this just more for the fun of doing it? Do bear in mind, of course, that you do only have one fan on this and we're using this as an exhaust, but bear in mind we've got our power supply there is a little bit of an intake and this isn't a particularly out there PC in terms of the amount of power that it's gonna use and heat dispersal is not gonna be like huge. I think this is gonna work well, assuming it does work. We'll grab ourselves a keyboard, mouse, and of course the PC-centric mouse mat that you can buy today, link is down below. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to damage you. Moment of truth. Well, no RGB, because of course this isn't a RGB-based system. But ultimately, this is one of the compromises that I was talking about, right? I mean, why spend a load extra money for all these components that have all of this RGB bling when it's not really gonna impact your frame rate? I mean, I don't think this is gonna win awards for best looking PC system ever, but right now, we are waiting for a signal. And we've got one! I was about to say that with a Ryzen system, you do have to wait like a minute or two for it to do its initial RAM training, and then it will load into a copy of Windows, assuming that you have downloaded it on a USB drive and stuck it in the back of your PC. If you don't know how to install Windows and you wanna know how simple or difficult it might be, you can find my full video in the top right -hand corner of your screen. But as I've already got mine installed and it does indeed look like we are working, give me a few hours to get some games on this and then we'll show you the benchmarks. And of course, through the power of editing, here we are, all set up and ready to go. And again, I think this thing is really quite small. It's refreshing, but I guess, I don't know, it doesn't have that much presence on your desk, which some people will like, some people won't. But let's jump into the games. Let us begin by jumping out of our plane in some Apex Legends. This, of course, is the multiplayer title that I used to be addicted to, but I think I ran out of talent and haven't actually uh, competitively played in a while, but still absolutely love it. And this is currently set to 1440p, and we're running this at high settings. And as you can see, our frame rate is pretty darn good. We're currently getting about 144 frames a second or so. Obviously, we are gonna see a little bit of variance here, and you can turn some of the settings down if you do wanna get a slightly higher frame rate, but bearing in mind most high-end gaming monitors are 1440p, maybe 165 hertz. This is still very much in that proper sweet spot. Oh, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Oh, what's happened there? What's happened there? 1440p is all well and good though, but most people are probably gonna be playing at 1080p. And that is exactly where this system really does come into its own, as we're currently getting about 185 frames a second in Apex Legends at high settings. I mean, that is pretty darn cool. And even if you did wanna play ultra competitively and you wanna make sure that you've got like a no compromises system, well, this is still more than enough horsepower to actually get you by. The only thing that I will draw your attention to though is the fact that our CPU cooler it's definitely not the best i mean this whole system is pretty quiet but we're currently sitting at about 87 degrees on that cpu so if you were to properly flex this and utilize all of its performance then i think you are going to start to get into not necessarily thermal throttling but definitely temperatures that are not the most comfortable i mean here's your noise test so you see noise wise very very impressive but for the sake of about 30, 40 pounds, you can get a much more attractive and much better performing CPU cooler. 
But let's head over to something a little bit more intense, shall we? With some Cyberpunk 2077. And once again, we're going to start our testing at 1440p. What you're seeing here is actually set to the Ultra preset, where you don't have any ray tracing enabled, but we do have Fidelity FX set to quality. And as you can see, we're currently getting about 60 frames a second or so, so it's nothing crazy. It's definitely not the most responsive game that you ever play. But bear in mind, this is a single player title. This is still more than you need, really, especially bear in mind we are running at 1440p. If we do go into the options, though, we can, of course, turn this down to 1080p. And I do also want to turn on a little bit of ray tracing so we can see whether our PC can handle next-gen gaming. And to be fair, the frame rate actually isn't too bad. It has gone under that 60 FPS mark. It's going to be okay if you've got like a FreeSync monitor or something like that, but you can definitely feel now that this is not such a nice experience. And obviously you can tell that the quality of the image has gone down due to that resolution. And this is when it just doesn't really make sense to enable ray tracing, to be honest with you. Like I know if you've got an Nvidia card and you're gonna use DLSS 3.5, you can still boost it further and you've got better performance. But even then, I mean, it doesn't matter how good your PC looks. If you're getting latency figures like we have now, where it's around about 90 to 100 milliseconds of latency, it's just not worth it. So let's turn ray tracing off in its entirety now. And now we're currently getting about 82 frames a second or so. So around about 90 frames a second at 1080p. This isn't going to be the absolute best way you could play Cyberpunk. Obviously, you're going to want an RTX 4090 for that. But actually, just for playing the game, which is what most people want to do with the game, right? I think you're going to be very, very happy with the end result. Of course, though, not everyone wants to play something that is so intense, something so first person. So what about a more traditional PC game like Diablo 4? And kicking off once again at 1440p, you can see that our frame rate is pretty wild, actually. We're getting around about 130 frames a second or so. I mean, it is going to vary quite a lot depending on what's going on in the title. If you're just walking around a town rather than what we have here, then clearly you're going to get a higher frame rate. Of course, though, if you are playing at 1080p, then you are going to get an even higher frame rate with our current performance set to around about 200 frames a second. But of course, there is one game that you guys are always asking for more than anything else, some Call of Duty Warzone. So let's jump straight in and have a look what is on offer. Again, this is 1440p. This is set to the extreme presets. We'll be turning this down in a little bit. But as you can clearly see, there's not necessarily going to be that much reason to do that because the frame rate we're currently getting is already pretty impressive, around about 100 to 120 FPS. Now, I will draw your attention to the the fact that we are already slightly bottlenecked on that CPU. This is an incredibly CPU demanding game. And while our utilization is currently around about 100%, you can see it dips every now and then into the high 80s. So if you were going to step up to like a 7800X3D, then you would get more performance. But to be honest, for one game to get an extra like 5, 10 FPS more, I wouldn't really say that's necessarily worth it. Oh! Oh, I'm trying to do voiceover and you've got some camper there sitting in the hut waiting for me. Oh, blast, blast, blast. It's so friggin' annoying. Oh, he's done it. How has he done it? <laughs> I thought it was game over. Oh, well, let's bring this story home and turn it down to 1080p like I was trying to do before I got shot. And indeed, turning it down to 1080p and spectating, because I may or may not have uh, died when I hit the floor, you can see that our frame rate hasn't changed. And yeah, this is a result of that CPU. You could go for something more expensive, but honestly, just wait a year or two until there are new Ryzen AM5 CPUs that will have way more performance than the 7800X3D anyway, and then that will be a more meaningful upgrade. But I'd say on the whole, this is a very balanced system. And while it's not necessarily my favorite case I've used, for the money, it's pretty Pretty premium and if you like the look and you like the size I think it will appeal but I would love to hear your thoughts on this what do you make of our budget gaming system have we got a lot right or is it all wrong let us know down in the comment section below if you have enjoyed this video please smash that like button it really helps out and of course get subscribed and if you do want to check out current pricing on anything featured in this video you can find it listed down below with our Amazon affiliate links but thank you so much for watching this video we'll catch you in the next one